This is Professor Michael Chapman. I'm one of the most experienced IVF doctors in Australia. I believe that an important part that I can contribute is to educate patients in relation to fertility, infertility, and all that that involves. These series of podcasts help to educate you. I hope they are helpful to you. If you wish to know more, however, I'm more than happy to have you contact me via email, which is profmchapman at gmail.com, or make an appointment to see me on 91384222 how are ivf success rates calculated and what factors <laughs> contribute to success or failure so that's probably an hours talk but and it's a worldwide debate as to what the best ways to do it in australia uh, there is an official website which is has been built up from the data provided by the Australian National Database called ANZARD, where every IVF cycle in Australia has to be recorded as part of the accreditation process for every clinic in Australia. So the 80,000 80, cycles, fresh cycles, are recorded and the outcomes documented. So that's where the data comes from, uh, and it's now on, an, on a national, it's accessible on the internet called Your IVF Success. And, and But <laughs> the controversy remains that which way you judge whether a clinic is good or not. <laughs> and so just going, th- and, and so they actually report five different ways of reporting success. So you can report success based upon the, the number of babies divided by the number of cycles that were started. Okay. However, somewhere between 10 and 20% of cycles get cancelled because the woman doesn't respond well. So that'll be the lowest success rate because if there's 15 to 20 or 10 to 20% of the denominator actually were never really IVF cycles that went anywhere. The next way to describe it is to take every egg collection and divide it by the number of live births or the other way around and and then on the basis of that say every egg collection the success rate is this that has that's probably one of the better ways of doing it because the next way is to look at fresh cycles only so you do an IVF cycle and you collect the eggs you create an embryo and you put an embryo back that cycle now in Australia about 15 percent of cycles the, the embryos are frozen so they're not going to be included in that statistic. So that makes it more complicated <laughs> and reduces the, the success rate from a fresh transfer per egg collection. And then you can go for what's called the cumulative pregnancy rate. And that's probably the most realistic in terms of telling a patient that if they transfer a certain, have a, a sufficient number of transfers, how many, ba- how many babies are created from that one egg collection because if one egg collection something like 50 percent of cycles will have a frozen embryo if you're under under 40 that's that's correct in that case if if you've got two embryos then the cumulative pregnancy rate is putting those two transfers together and that in a woman under 38 should be around 60 to 65 percent which sounds great and if you've got three embryos from that cycle it it goes up to 75 percent and so on so it depends, it, it, the cumulative pregnancy rates actually give you a, a better feel for what you're likely, how well you're likely to get pregnant. In addition to the those success rate reporting, now the downsides of those reports that you can go on the internet is they happened two years ago. Those were cycles in a laboratory two years ago because that data can't be collected until at least nine months after the cycle was begun. And then that data has to be collated. And so it's another year before all of that data is put together. So it's out of date information and a, and a clinic can vary from year to year. The, yeah, that's the biggest downside of those reporting. <clears throat> what I, I don't think many patients really judge where to go based upon success rates. All the larger clinics have pretty much the same pregnancy rates. There might be, one year, two or three percentage points better for one, 
So instead of 32, it's 35 this year, but next year it'll be 33. It varies from year to year, um, but all of them are in that 30, low 30s range for a standard group of patients under the age of 38. If a clinic treats lots of older patients, their overall success rate is going to be lower. There are varying um, populations um, that will also affect those, those uh, results. Um, I was just going to say the last bit of information that comes out of that ANZAD is something that is an individual predictor of success with IVF. And what you do is you go online, and it's called My, the My Success IVF, and you go online and you put in your age, whether you smoke, whether you've had babies before, what your weight is. All of those factors go in. And based upon the data that we have now hundreds of thousands of cycles, we've been able to produce a document or a, 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 an algorithm that gives you a good chance of an idea of how successful you might be. Many doctors, uh, specialists, in fact, use it to show patients what their success rates are or likely to be. What it, for me, the big benefit is in older women because it, it, it's harsh to know this, but when you see in black and white that your chances of success are less than 5% in an IVF cycle, m many women may not necessarily go ahead. Albeit, <laughs> I would have to say that 70% who turn up to my clinic and talk to me and I tell them that it's less than 5% will say, I'm going to be in that 5%, I want to do it. And, I, and I, I don't say no because there's a significant psychological issue around not doing something when there's a possibility. It's a bit like in some uh, taking experimental cancer drugs for if you've got cancer. It may do, you may do it, you may be a, the winner, but you may not be. So it is a problem. That's, that, that's about success rates. And don't forget that you can access all the previous episodes by going to our website www.theivfjourney.com and select IVF Journey Podcast from the navigation menu.